welcome back after our short break. Um, it is, um, we now move to the next session, which is really on advancing innovation by co collaboration that will also impact low resource settings. It is my pleasure to hand over to Rosanna Peeling, who led the Zika plan work package on setting up a diagnostics platform for evaluation of novel diagnostics. And um, I'm very pleased that Rosanna will also chair this session. Over, over to you. And the first talk, in fact, is by Rosanna. Thank you, Annalise. And um, it's, uh, it, it gives me great pleasure to present our work on behalf of our um, uh, work package. Um, so let me share my screen and go to presentation mode. Okay, so um, what I what I like to do is to just uh, go over a little bit of the background and then uh, what we're going to uh, what we did actually in the last few years. Um, I think very early on in the in the Zika outbreak, we realized that the diagnosis of active Zika uh, virus infection has been hampered by very extensive cross reactivity. Uh, of uh, IgM tests among members of the Flavi family, uh, Flavi virus family, such as uh, uh, cross reactivity with dengue, with uh, West Nile, et cetera. And so, um, as WHO urged companies and uh, academic researchers to develop more sensitive and more specific seeker assays, uh, the number one priority that um, a lot of this uh, test developers identified is having access to well characterized samples and clinical trial sites uh, for the development and evaluation of the Zika tests that we need, uh, especially for identifying active infection in pregnant women. So our work package was to uh, support the development of novel seeker diagnostic tests uh, by assembling a virtual biobank with access to well-characterized specimens uh, and uh, a network of clinical trial sites so that we could do evaluations of the tests that are developed. Um, and we wanted uh, to harmonize procedures and the governance for all the biobanking sites and uh, the protocols for evaluation so that we could accelerate uh, the validation uh, of the performance of these tests and have them put into use without delay. Now, why virtual biobank? Um, this actually was it's, uh, based on a decision of the group uh, when I presented to them my experience of um, setting up bow banks within uh, WHO TDR for diseases of uh, poverty. And so uh, each, we ended up with three models, uh, a centralized model where all the specimens are in uh, one physical bow bank. Um, and that is the model for our TB one. And that's based on the uh, specific recommendation of our TB advisory group, as well as the resources available from the Gates Foundation. And then for dengue and malaria, we ended up with a regional hub based on our advisory group for malaria. And then um, for other diseases where we don't have very many resources, in fact, we decided to have a, a decentralized or just a network of biobanking sites where all the specimens are stored and characterized at the site of collection. So what experience have we learned from you know, nine years of doing this? is that although the single biobank is uh, really useful in terms of having a, a single point of a very simple infrastructure, a single point for assem uh, assembling uh, uh, evaluation panels for distribution of specimens needed for development, it's got great disadvantages in that it's very expensive to maintain uh, and also because of having to ship specimens from all over the world to that central bank, there's a lot of very complicated paperwork involved um, and a risk of ship, losing shipments or loss of the specimen quality during shipping. And that's happened uh, with some of the shipments that we have. And also the paperwork took a long time uh, between the size of collection and our bank and WHO TDR 
and um, it was a, a, a big nightmare and uh, resulted in a lot of delay. Now, down to the uh, last model, the, the um, decentralized model or the virtual network, it's in fact, we found it to be the most sustainable because uh, very little uh, uh, shipment is involved. Uh, in fact, um, uh, only specimens going out to uh, developers uh, to, for uh, helping with the development of tests. Nothing is uh, uh, has to be shipped for evaluations because all the tests are being shipped to the sites. Um, and we found also over time that we've actually built country capacity for doing their own evaluations, not only for Zika, but for other diseases, diagnostics for other diseases. And we could use the sites for ongoing um, uh, quality assurance of the tests that arrive in the country or, uh, or being used. The disadvantage of that, of course, is that uh, you have to really make sure that all the sites maintain the same quality standards, use the same uh, uh, essays for uh, as a gold standard and for a characterizing tests. There may be sample heterogeneity from site to site, which has to be taken into account. And also um, there's uh, shipping of tests to different sites and they need to have a very efficient way of uh, receiving the samples so that the test quality is not compromised during the shipment. So having decided on the virtual bank for, for Zika, uh, we looked at the guiding principles because this represents our values in uh, setting up uh, biobanks. And we're guided by a number of interna international treaties that looks at a fair and equitable sharing of um, benefits. Uh, it, the Nogoya Protocol started uh, for was started with for biodiversity, but it's now been adopted for for many things, including uh, um, biobanks. And of course, uh, we we have the Declaration of Helsinki that really protects the rights of individuals, the autonomy of individuals to uh, decline to uh, share their specimen or not, um, and also uh, protection of privacy uh, and confidentiality for individuals as well as uh, for communities or collectives. And because of the uh, virtual bank, we could actually have um, the ownership retained uh, at the at the site of uh, collection or by the countries themselves, and but overall we want to have transparency of how we acquire the specimens, how we give access to the specimens, and uh, be accountable uh, to all the stakeholders. Now, for for uh, bio banking for epidemic preparedness, uh, what we need are two things besides what I've just said is the speed. We need to quickly uh, put a, a, a network together. And for this, we actually have really good uh, collaboration uh, with uh, conversations with the Seeker Alliance and Seeker Action, and especially uh, Xavier um, in his experience with the European archive, uh, virus archive. That's been very useful for us to think about how we would set up and operate um, this bank. And so with that, we uh, put in a, quite a simple governance uh, where we have a steering committee giving all oversight to the entire uh, operation, but a scientific committee to decide uh, the requests uh, on the request for uh, uh, specimens, as well as um, uh, how much to give in terms of access, uh, and also decide on the evaluation protocols uh, and also making sure that uh, all the um, uh, requests for specimens are based on very sign, uh, found uh, scientific experiments uh, to develop uh, uh, the test that we need. And all this is, um, uh, as I said, uh, have, uh, all the specimens have informed consent. And uh, so we actually had a call uh, for uh, size as well as uh, the sites within our diagnostics work package. And, um, and so here is the network. And uh, you could see on the left-hand side, uh, we have um, uh, the London School, we have University of Le uh, North Carolina. That's part of our network, uh, our work package. Uh, 
we have uh, Cuba um, and Colombia, Senegal, they're all part of our work package. We later on took on um, the National Institute for Quality Control in Brazil uh, for uh, evaluations of tests. And also as part of our uh, network, uh, the Fondation Mirier in France, uh, the Swiss Tropical Institute, the Institute for Tropical Medicine in Belgium. And then additionally, we took on three sites in Asia, mainly for additional specimens uh, for, uh, for chikungunya and other uh, uh, diseases that um, may actually cross, uh, cross, cross reactions uh, to uh, the test. So we wanted to have a very well, um, very robust challenge panel to make sure the specificity of the seeker tests are uh, as optimal as possible. And so in total, we have these uh, 12 sites uh, that could actually help with the uh, development and evaluation of the test. Now, what's the um, legacy? So we, um, when, when COVID came um, uh, in January and, uh, of last year, uh, we, the head of the Africa CDC, John Nkengesong, uh, uh, actually reached out to me and said, uh, we need uh, training uh, for how to diagnose uh, uh, COVID. And, um, and could we organize uh, some workshops on training, as well as look into whether it's possible to set up a biobank similar to what I've set up uh, for Sika. And, um, and so um, I immediately talked with uh, Xavier, with Annalise, uh, and, um, and uh, people at WHO. And it, by February, we were organizing uh, workshops for countries to, uh, for COVID diagnosis and started the discussion on biobanks. And, um, and by August, we've already set up a biobanking mechanism for Af the Africa CDC. And, uh, and as part of that, um, they also incorporated research into uh, their biobanking uh, network so that uh, right now there's also uh, an institute for pathogen genomics that's been set up. Um, uh, just recently um, and, and funded. And so this is a, a really, really useful way to think about how within a very short time, they adopted our, our car, uh, governance, our framework, how we organize ourselves. And right now is for COVID, but uh, we're already looking at other diseases of epidemic potential that is uh, um, special to Africa, such as uh, um, meningitis uh, in the meningitis belt of Africa, as well as um, cholera, etc. And so uh, there will be different uh, networks set up for, for different diseases. In the meantime, um, after Zika was uh, no longer uh, a matter of international concern, UNICEF and USAID was very disappointed that we, um, the, the development of uh, more sensitive and specific seeker tests had um, not been continued beyond that because a lot of diagnostic companies that were developing these tests after the outbreak was over decided to drop the projects. So um, UNICEF and USAID use an advanced purchase mechanism, uh, advanced purchase commitment mechanism to try to incentivize the continued development of specific seeker tests. And, and they approach us to use our seeker plan uh, biobank network to evaluate tests that uh, fulfill their criteria for, for performance. And, um, and, and this evaluation, the results of this evaluation will be used to inform UNICEF uh, procurement for these tests. And right now, um, there are a number of tests, both multiplex tests as well as uh, seeker um, uh, tests. Uh, for IgM and IgG that are being piloted uh, with funding from UNICEF and USAID uh, for surveillance in, in a, a small number of countries right now. And in the meantime, for COVID, um, I've been sharing our uh, framework and governance with 
uh, FIND, uh, the Foundation for uh, Innovative New Diagnostics and WHO uh, for the development of biobanking networks for diseases of epidemic potential beyond COVID. And FIND also has an interest in um, a biobanking network for neglected tropical diseases. So this is, has been our legacy. And I must say that um, I have an enormous number of people to thank, uh, all the members of our um, uh, work package, uh, and also a, a special call out to uh, Debbie Boras from the Global Health Impact Group, who organized a lot of this work uh, together with me, and our sites in Asia, as well as um, uh, UNICEF uh, USAID for their um, uh, continue support of our uh, network and people at the London School at our International Diagnostic Center. And, um, and last but not least, uh, to thank the e European Union for funding uh, for our project. Thank you very much. So with that, I like to stop sharing and, um, uh, and could I call on uh, Dr. Bart Jacobs to um, give his presentation on the uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, uh, seeker related studies and preparations for future pandemics. Uh, Dr. Jacobs is uh, from the Erasmus uh, University Medical Center uh, in the Netherlands. Over to you, Dr. Jacobs. Okay, thank you. Um, can you see my presentation? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you um, as well for the uh, invitation to present uh, the work on the Guillain-Barre syndrome uh, that has been um, investigated as part of the uh, Zika plan uh, consortium. So just as a very short introduction to this disorder, uh, that may probably be familiar to many of you, but not to all. Um, it's a severe inflammation of the peripheral nerves causing uh, paralysis of the limbs, but also of the cranial muscles and also of the respiratory muscles. It's a rare disease uh, with a frequency of one to two per hundred thousand per year. So um, that means that there are about a hundred thousand new patients um, every year in the world. It is a very diverse uh, clinical presentation and it has a very diverse differential diagnosis. And related to that, there are many uh, diagnostic uh, dilemmas in this disease. About 20% of the patients uh, will develop respiratory failure, sometimes for uh, more than a month. Um, and they are ventilated on an ICU and still two to 12% of the patients may die from this disease. Uh, the treatment is with immunoglobulins or with plasma freezes, uh, both expensive treatments that are not uh, available in many countries, as you uh, may realize. And important for uh, the Zika consortium is that it may be triggered by preceding infections such as Zika. And to be honest, I have never heard uh, before about the Zika virus until this publication came out in 2016, where uh, at French Polynesia, an association was suggested between uh, the Zika virus uh, uh, epidemic and the Guillain-Barre syndrome. And immediately that uh, raised many questions um, because it was unsure if this was truly uh, the Guillain-Barre syndrome, considering all the diagnostic uh, dilemmas in this disease. Um, the authors reported an exonal form of the uh, disease, which is unusual for preceding viral infections. Um, there were antibodies detected, uh, and there was very little information about the clinical course and outcome of these patients and the impact uh, on society. So in, in 2012, um, we were already um, conducting uh, this study, the International GBS Outcome Study, uh, which is an uh, observational study uh, in patients with the Guillain-Barre syndrome, including all the variants and uh, severity independent of the uh, treatment. And as you can see on the stud study protocol, uh, we are collecting clinical data, treatment data, biosamples, uh, neurophysiology, which is important for the diagnosis, cerebrospinal fluid and DNA. 
Um, and at a, at a moment when the, uh, the uh, Zika uh, epidemic started, uh, we had included around uh, 1,400 uh, patients already. Uh, and since then, we have included an additional 500 patients. They are carefully characterized, uh, carefully checked for the diagnosis and for many other uh, important uh, items. And as you can see, uh, when uh, Zika uh, started, uh, we had a fair representation around the world, but especially in uh, South America, um, where the Zika was then ongoing, uh, we had no representation. Important also is that uh, this study is supported by the Inflammatory Neuropathy Consortium. Those are uh, neuromuscular uh, specialists with an expertise in GBS, and we have regular uh, meetings uh, and, and part of congresses are also reserved for this, uh, for this team. So um, immediately uh, what we could do is uh, share our ICOS protocol with uh, organizations that plan to investigate the relation between Zika and uh, GBS. Um, so I think that was a good thing that we could do uh, right away. Uh, so we sh shared our uh, ICOS protocol with uh, Jim Sefiar from CDC, uh, Carlos Pardo from NEOS, Tom Solomon from Zika Neurology Network, uh, and also with Uma Pata from Sing Health. And in fact, they could start uh, including patients uh, sooner than, uh, than we could start with uh, uh, investigating the relation between uh, Zika and uh, the Guillain-Barre syndrome. So that was dedicated an, an sub-study within IGOS called uh, the IGOS uh, Zika study. And that was a case control designed uh, study with more specified uh, questions related to Zika. So um, this, this resulted in a an, in an, uh, very productive collaboration uh, with many uh, members uh, of work group uh, two and four uh, in, in Zika plan. Most of these people I had never met before, uh, and that all resulted in very uh, productive uh, and interesting collaborations. So we were able to, to start this dedicated ICOL Zika case control uh, study, collecting samples from patients in the uh, Zika related uh, areas in the world, uh, and also from, from controls. Um, we also started a collaboration with the Brazilian uh, Neurological Society because we were interested to see what, um, what uh, limitations uh, neuro neurologists experienced during the Zika pandemic when we knew that there were many patients with the Guillain-Barre syndrome in their ICU, for instance. So uh, together with them, we designed a uh, survey uh, to get a better grip on what was going on in, uh, in Brazil. And uh, more than 200 uh, Brazilian neurologists participated in this uh, survey, which was also published. And that made us realize that one of the things that was most urgently needed was a uh, clinical guideline, especially for the diagnosis and the treatment of GBS. Uh, at that time, there were plans already uh, to have an, uh, a guideline developed by the Peripheral Nerve Society, and I was also involved in that already. But that was a rather slow process based on a very uh, strict format um, and that would result in, an, in a very extensive guideline with a lot of systemic uh, uh, literature uh, reviews uh, included in that. Um, uh, and that guideline is, of course, is very uh, valuable for the, for the true uh, uh, experts. But um, we also wanted to have a guideline that could be used in all hospitals around the world. Also for, uh, for not even neurologists, but just for clinicians that saw uh, patients with Guillain-Barre syndrome. And for that, we, we developed the first international consensus guideline, which is a very practical guideline, uh, which, which follows a 10 steps uh, uh, approach for the diagnosis and treatment. And this was developed by many GBS experts around the world, but also with many uh, colleagues uh, from the Zika affected uh, uh, areas uh, that we just met via uh, Zika plan. And I think their input was uh, essential to make uh, this, uh, this guideline uh, uh, feasible. And then we had uh, contact with uh, uh, Ready and the Global Health uh, Network to develop a GBS uh, knowledge hub in which we would like to explain on a website exactly uh, these steps. Uh, that was also important for uh, colleagues who were unable to uh, have access to, uh, to the literature. 
So um, what is important um, is that um, uh, this was not the first uh, pandemic or outbreak that was related to uh, the keen embrace syndrome. Uh, one second. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm at home with my, with my daughter who is in quarantine at the, at the moment. Um, so in, in 1976, there was already a uh, flu vaccination, uh, which uh, was related to the keelan syndrome. And that was followed in almost every year with uh, outbreaks of Campylobacter or Chikungunya or Zika. And uh, now more recently, there's a lot of interest in SARS-CoV-2, whether that is uh, related to uh, the keelan syndrome uh, as well. And in, in anticipation of, of, uh, of the, the issues that may arise, um, when there are new infections, uh, especially uh, pandemics, uh, uh, where the Keelan Barre uh, syndrome is related to, um, we wrote this uh, position paper where we uh, have indicated some limitations and, and opportunities for, uh, for further uh, investigations. Uh, this was definitely not an easy task um, to, uh, to investigate uh, the uh, relation between Zika and the Keelan Barre syndrome. One of the, uh, the major limitations we had was the, uh, the, the availability of the funding. So you can see this here in this graph. Um, in, in February uh, in 2015, uh, WHO declared Zika virus a public health uh, emergency. Then the uh, European Union responded very fast with uh, uh, having this funding uh, uh, ready, uh, but still it took about uh, nine months before we received that funding and could really start with our ICOS Zika uh, project and hire people and support uh, people uh, in the affected countries. And that by that time, most of the Zika uh, epidemic was already uh, gone. So it was much more difficult to get access to, uh, to patient materials and data. Luckily enough, before the time, we were already uh, able to share our protocol with others who could make a, a sooner start, but this is really an important aspect to consider for, uh, for the future. So this is no criticism to the EU because I think they responded uh, very fast, but it just illustrates the bureaucracy and all the steps that need to be taken before research can really start. And that's, I think, a very crucial factor when there is an, uh, an pandemic ongoing. So what are the, um, in our view, uh, the challenges and the requirements for, for to get a good study infrastructure? is to have uh, what the lessons that we learned is that it's important to have a predefined study protocol for such a very specific disease as the keelan syndrome uh, to, to get an, an access on what data is, is required for diagnostic accuracy, relevant clinical outcome measures, uh, how controls are defined. Um, then also uh, it is important to have the funding, uh, to have ethical permission and to uh, have the av availability to share these uh, data and samples. But as, as I've shown you, the funding was, uh, well, it was a delay of, of, nine, uh, of nine months. And there are very strict uh, uh, regulations, as you know, uh, within Europe, the GDPR, uh, to uh, exchange uh, data and samples. Um, so how we approach this, um, um, I think it's very important that there is fast mobilization uh, of fundings uh, for the future. Um, so um, I'm very much looking forward to uh, initiatives uh, like uh, Clopid R, who may uh, help us in that. Um, and also there can be already a fast track review or upfront uh, approvals that are uh, ready in, in, in or already in place uh, just when a new outbreak will occur. And I think an important example of that, that it is possible is, uh, is, is, is done by the, by the NIH. Um, so um, I think another important aspect that made me realize is that if you want to investigate uh, GBS and probably that occurs in other diseases as well, is that clinical expertise is, uh, is key. There's, it's not possible in my view to have good uh, clinical research if there's no clinical expertise and for that the guideline was important. So I have to explain to you that we have developed this guideline. Here you can see a representation of the countries uh, of the colleagues that were involved in that. Um, there are translations of that guideline in Spanish, Portuguese, and uh, Chinese. Chinese now upgoing, and all that information will be 
at the ready uh, uh, website of the uh, global health network and i'm pretty sure that that will be um, uh, uh, consulted very frequently so um, you may have a look uh, at, the, at the website there uh, to see how that works it's a very straightforward approach you don't have to be an, a specialist uh, and in this 10-step approach we hope to help all the clinicians that uh, may encounter a patient with the Bray syndrome so the Knowledge Hub is currently uh, under development. Uh, we really want to extend that with courses and more updated information, um, information about uh, research as well, where uh, people can also participate in. And also that's very important as a preparedness for, for clinical practice and for, for research. So the lack and see uh, regarding uh, the Keelan Bray syndrome. Is the, is the network I think that we have uh, between IGOS and the many other uh, consortia that are uh, ongoing. So I think that's a very good global covering of, uh, of, uh, of uh, expertise in, in GBS. There is the international guideline that of course is a live uh, document that will be, uh, will be changed after there are new treatments or new uh, discoveries and the, the knowledge hub, which is uh, uh, under development. So there are many people that I would like to thank, um, especially uh, the people that I've met uh, in, uh, in Zika plan uh, from work package uh, two and four, but I also would like to thank uh, Trudy Lang and her team for support uh, via the Global Health Network in the, in the GBS Knowledge Hub and uh, providing the opportunity to share the, the guideline with, uh, with many others. And my last but not least uh, slide is to, to thank again the European uh, Union uh, who supported uh, our work. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Jacob. Um, I, we, have, uh, we now have a, a few minutes for uh, questions. Uh, we have a question from the chat for you. Um, is onset GBS primarily associated with only seeker? or other infectious diseases can trigger onset? For example, have you seen a rise in cases with COVID-19? Uh, you're on mute. Yeah. Okay, so, sorry. Yes, that, so, so there are many uh, infections that may trigger uh, the guillain barre syndrome. Um, the most important ones are the Campylobacter jejuni, uh, cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, mycoplasma, pneumonia, um, and hepatitis E virus. Um, then we have a new one that's, that's Zika. Um, and um, uh, it's still not sure uh, if there is an association between uh, SARS-CoV-2 infections and the guillain barre syndrome. So there have been cases reported or case series. The true association studies are lacking. Um, there has been a national study in the UK uh, showing no increase in guillain barre cases during the Zika uh, outbreak, but that still does not exclude that in rare cases uh, this may occur. And within ICOS, we are now investigating a case series, uh, and we have found uh, several patients with um, uh, the Guillain Bray syndrome and preceding uh, SARS CoV 2 infection without any other uh, infections. And they seem to have a kind of a viral uh, phenotype regarding their clinical features and electrophysiology. But still, I would like to underscore that that is not, not a proof that SARS-CoV-2 in fact can cause uh, the guillain bray syndrome and further research is needed for that. Thank you. And, and actually, I have a, a question for you. I mean, you've presented a wonderful way that all um, this work has come together and then you know, accumulating in the first international consensus guidelines, et cetera. I think the willingness to share data and sharing protocols has really transformed the, the, uh, and accelerated the pace of research uh, to inform uh, clinical care uh, and policy, et cetera. But um, can, you, can you comment on how sustainable this is beyond, you know, between waves of, um, uh, these infections or, or it, it's, it's the syndrome itself, um, um, you know, you could, could it be sustained um, and, and during peacetime as well as uh, during uh, epidemics? Yeah, so so we, we are very willing to share uh, our protocol as we did uh, in the past. Um, 
Uh, so that, that protocol will always be uh, available, but I think the protocol can be improved. Uh, and um, we are about to have uh, the last patient included in ICOS. So uh, when our aim was to, re to reach 2000 inclusions, but we are, uh, we will develop a new uh, ICOS 2.0 uh, uh, format, which will be more effective uh, and focused on, on certain areas. And uh, also that protocol will be made available for, uh, for the whole world. Um, even if you're not interested to really uh, participate in ICOS itself, uh, you can still use uh, the protocol. And, and what is my experience in Zika plan is that when other groups are then using the same protocol, then it still is possible to compare data or share data afterwards. And they have a kind of, of independence uh, for, for controlling their data collection. Um, and, and the ICOS consortium can live with that. So we are definitely uh, regarding ICOS, uh, let's say protocols, we are, we are willing to share that in the future as well. But there will be new developments, there will be new infections, uh, the diagnostic criteria are about to change. Uh, there's a lot of development in, in the treatment of the Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, so this is, this is all uh, a, a dynamic situation uh, that needs updates. And um, I think a very crucial thing is the, uh, the, the connection uh, between neurologists uh, from, from all over uh, the world uh, to give input. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's my most precious thing that, that we, we have now that, that collaboration ongoing. And I would like to invest a lot uh, in that uh, in the next years as well. And, and would funding be um, easier to get because of you know, everybody banding together? Thing. Yes, I, I hope so. In, also, what may help. in competition, right? Between yeah, no, absolutely. And, and this is a rare disease. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so we are competing with more, much more frequent neurological diseases. But I think everyone has seen now that uh, in Zika that there may be an association between the pandemic and, and the Guillain Bray syndrome. And uh, I'm very uh, happy that uh, there was no very strong association between SARS-CoV-2 and GBS. Otherwise, there would be a really dramatic situation. Uh, and this may be a good momentum for uh, to get an, an, an a more uh, a bigger support for international uh, uh, co coordination of, uh, of research. Uh, and I hope that the, the political uh, ambition is there uh, as well to, uh, to, to do this. But we will just have to see how things are going. Well, thank you. And, and I do have a question in the chat, uh, in the Q&A, on uh, the, um, whether we have um, uh, good diagnostics now to diagnose uh, um, acute infection, especially for screening pregnant women. So I think that um, the situation is similar to those, uh, uh, what we do in dengue, which is for surveillance, uh, uh, a lot of countries use IgM uh, because the um, uh, IgM antibodies persist for about five to six months. So you could, if somebody's IgM positive, you could only say that they had a recent, um, uh, but uh, not necessarily uh, an infection associated with the episode of fever patient has at the moment. And so uh, for surveillance purposes, we, um, in uh, pregnant women or in other individuals, uh, we use IgM and uh, usually in a population there's an endemic or low level um, IgM. But uh, when you have an outbreak, then you would see all of a sudden more people who are IgM positive, as well as the teeters are higher. And so, uh, so that's how it's used. Now for um, the uh, diagnosis, uh, clinical diagnosis, uh, of um, uh, say pregnant women, uh, in a clinical setting, if the women presents uh, for, for care with an episode of fever um, and uh, the onset is within the first seven days, of course, the idea would be to use molecular testing, but many physicians will use IgM. And uh, we now have uh, through the uh, UNICEF uh, USAID um, effort, uh, we now have quite specific tests for Zika, which can be used. And we also have multiplex tests that uh, includes all other uh, major arboviruses, um, and, or you could have a specific uh, uh, Zika IgM and IgG test. 
And so if you like more information, we, uh, we could send those to you. Um, any other questions? If not, we're um, right on time. And I want to turn this uh, session uh, back to Annalise and thank uh, uh, Dr. Jacobs for his great presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank, and thank you, Rosanna, for sharing and speaking. And thank you, Bart, for, for speaking so excellently. So we're now coming to our concluding remarks. Uh, let me again thank the Global Health Network for putting this webinar together, especially Bonnie Baker. Uh, again, please do have a look at our website. Um, there you can also find the scientific publications. Today we focus a lot on the legacy, the networks, but of course there's, an, there's a huge scientific output as well. Allow me to also thank Margot Luciani and her team from the Fondation Merieux for creating and maintaining uh, an exciting SIGA plan website, keeping up to date with the publications, putting together four videos. Um, Margot, if you can speak, are the four videos already up on the website or probably still coming on the website, Margot? Yes, they are on the website now. The first one that was shown today is on the website and the link has been shared in the chat. And we will also share the link through the Twitter account. Thank you so much, Margot, for leading all the Twitter, the, the websites, etc., and to the Global Health Network for hosting uh, the website. We would also like to thank Cora and Woolman Tardy, who, saved, who served as our Ziga Plan Communication Director for, from the very beginning of Ziga Plan and really helped us strategize the, uh, the communication plan. And also the logo that you see in the, our background that is, that is really from, the, from her team. Um, then I would now like to hand over to a very, very special person. And this is Raman Preet, who over the past years served as the most efficient and kind executive director of Ziga Plan. Over to you, Raman. Um, thank you so much, Annelise. Uh, I think it has been amazing uh, last five years working with all of us. But can I please request you to stop sharing your screen? Thank you, because I have some, uh, you know, I want to lighten up our moment. We are not so many left, and I'm sure some of us who've stayed back are going to enjoy because, you know, there has been a constant thanks for certain people, but I felt we would, I would like to remember some others or just bring us all together. So I'm going to quickly share screen, and I would like you all to stay with me for next five minutes. <clears throat> and also see that we are starting from 2016 till 2021. And because we've moved on into the social media world where it's hashtags have become more important than we started. So we are a consortium, we are a project, we are a collaboration. We are an international uh, cooperation and our hashtag is Zika Plan Unite. You heard Annalise so nicely putting us that together we stand stronger and I think united we achieve more. Many of you have heard, I just want to say 2016, this is how we started by June 2016, we were awarded. You've heard a lot about some delays, Bart was very uh, vividly talking about them, but still this is how, so exactly five years ago, we became a consortium. This is how we got formed. These crosses say these uh, members left us, <clears throat> but the others joined. It was a movement of one coordinator, so we had to make a change. But otherwise, we haven't had any hiccups. Also, we got the privilege of working with other uh, projects, which you've heard today, Zika Action and Zika Alliance. And I think it has been a pleasure, and we cannot express more the way we've done in our panel discussion. Further, this is how we planned our objectives. The red means we weren't very sure. So we really want to kind of, you know, work on things which were alarming. And we felt the blue is when we've achieved certain things, we'll be able to talk a bit more creatively and come. And I think today you've heard more about our blue uh, wheel rather than the red. But of course, the red has brung, uh, brought us to our blue wheel. You heard so much about our work packages and the past three web webinars, but we never showed you the intricate picture that stands behind these webinars. 
and how these work packages has worked around. This is how we are 15 work packages in Zika plan. These are our shared ones with Zika Action Alliance. And each work package, of course, has a lovely title, but each work package has a person behind who is supposed to deliver. And here you see the names. So I'm adding certain names here because we call work package leaders, but there are some people who have been key in making sure we are able to report, we are submitting our deliverables, and we are able to get our funds that make this project moving. So thanks to all these leaders behind these work packages. And our timeline has been very interesting. You know, we started with 2016, meeting at Hisifia Brazil, where it all started. Mark, thank you, Pernambuco and University for hosting us then. In 2017, we had the pleasure of being at Havana, dancing, enjoying, and we did our fun in Cuba. In 2018, we were in London, something happened. So this is a project coordinator story, something happened. So there is something missing here, which you will not see later. But then in 2019, we were in Cali, Colombia, we were, where we were at our peak, I would say, where we had media coverage, uh, Dr. Lida Soria, you know, Carlos, you've heard about them, it was well done. But then came something more that hit us in a different way. And we had to rethink how we are going to work towards our communication and dissemination. We got further extension, we got no more money, but we got more time. And we started to become more in deliberation of how we are going to disseminate ourselves. We've done three webinars, this is our final end. So I wanted to share maybe this, so you all know who are with us, that this has been a challenging work, but we've done it well. Our four operational areas were research, training and capacity building, networking and dissemination. This were always ongoing. Of course, things were a little different in the beginning, but the past five years, we've come along and making sure that there is not just North-South, but there has been South-South collaborations as well. We have 100 Zika plan publications out, 98 are available on our website, two will be added. And there are many more in preparations, so please keep an eye on that. Currently, the European Commission is actually asking for a lot on how would you create your impact? How would you improve your impact? And I think I would like to share with all my work package leaders and other members and all the audience who's sitting here, we followed this results-based management approach where we have looked at inputs, activities, outcomes, outputs, and impacts. And the entire story that you've heard today wasn't without this. So this is how, this is too detailed to be explained, but I just thought you can see how much work has gone behind. So here comes our wonderful time together. Hisife working in the hospital, media coverage. It was, as you've heard since the earlier in the afternoon, how people and us have worked together in collaboration. Here I also want to talk about the possibilities and power of projects, programs, partnerships, but people. It's the people who make things happen. It's our complementary approach. We synthesize, we synergize. And if we have a mandate, I think we perform better. This is again Cuba, Colombia. It's been an amazing journey. London is missing for some reason. But we became this. Right now, that's where we are. We all are in Zoom and we are trying to smile and make sure we are not, we still are there for each other. So I, this is our last webinar where we were saying goodbyes to all of us. And this list is definitely not exhaustive. Thanks to each one of you mentioned here. I'm sure I've forgotten some people and I'm sure I can't do justice in acknowledging each and every one, but I can say once, an email would go, it would go to at least 125 people many times. And there has been nothing but positive response. I do want to uh, thank these two people who Annalise has been doing. I thought I'll show their face before they put their camera on. And I, um, Bonnie Baker and Margot. And I especially want to acknowledge in the coordination story, finance managers and administrative contacts of every single partner who have been in this venture for making our reports happen and our European Commission project officers who have changed in the past four years, I think every year. So it's like starting a journey every new time. And finally, my big thanks to my scientific leader, Professor Annelies Wilder-Smith. We worked for 10 years now with two different projects. It has been an amazing, beautiful journey together. And I think this 
particular day has been very special because that's one time we've spent together in these 10 years looking at things we really enjoyed. So thank you, Annalise, and for the Department of Epidemiology and Global Health for hosting us. And finally, of course, we all cannot thank enough to uh, European Union for funding and our Zika Action and Zika Alliance partners. So thanks to all of you for sticking by and be with us and being here today. It has been nothing but very special. That's me. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>